Hello, thanks for joining us. I'm Pete Zielinski, Editor-in-Chief of Additive Manufacturing Media. Welcome to today's webinar titled Redefining Metal 3D Printing for Injection Mold Tooling, brought to you by Mantle. So Mantle has a metal 3D printing process that works differently from other approaches to 3D printing with metal, it was developed with tooling in mind, and more specifically with injection mold tooling in mind. If you've been in the audience for one of our webinars before, then this one is going to feel a little different. I'm going to basically just ask questions. I have with me Ted Sorum, the CEO and co-founder of Mantle. I'm going to ask him about the technology, uh, how it's used, uh, the role it might play for molders and mold makers. And if you are listening in, you can join us. There's a Q&A section at the right of your screen. I'll see the questions entered in that box and, and we'll see how it goes. We'll, we'll save those questions for the end of our talk, or I might ask some of them as we go along. So I, I just want to say hello to Ted Sorum. Ted, thank you for, for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm super excited to talk about what we do at the company and um, answer questions as they come up. So just to get started, uh, Ted, why don't you tell me about Mantle? Give me the thumbnail story. What's the company all about? How did it get started? What role does the company play today? Great. Uh, and I have some slides I'll throw up here every once in a while. Um, but fundamentally, Mantle is a metal printing company. I actually, actually prefer to refer to us as a digital manufacturing company, uh, really smoothing out the process of going from a CAD file to the part you want. Um, and we've perfected a really unique form of metal printing um, that delivers um, high accuracy, smooth surface, really intricate details um, that are a great fit for these tooling applications that you mentioned. So um, we've focused on that as a company, um, and as we're a bit different than other companies, I think, in metal printing, where they try to do everything, is what I've seen, you know, and with different uh, customers or different materials, they go after a lot of different segments. We decided very early on that we needed to really deliver a solution for our customers, not a technology that they needed a team of PhDs to figure out. Um, and so we really honed in on that, um, the tooling space. And with that, uh, you know, we're delivering real speed dramatically faster, up to 70% less time to make these type of tools. Uh, with reduction in steps and time, you're reducing that cost. So often a 50% reduction in the cost, uh, either cost parity to 50% reduction. Um, and then with the unique geometries you can print, we're making tooling more efficient and the production uh, cycle more efficient. We can talk about this more later, but usually in uh, sort of manufacturing or product development, you think of fast, cheap, and high quality, choose two. <laughs> um, our technology is really unique in that we actually can deliver on all three where we have a uh, improve the speed, improve the cost, and actually improve the quality of the part by controlling the temperature during the molding process, let's say for an injection mold, uh, better than you could otherwise. Um, I uh, am happy to tell you a little more about where we came from and how we started um, as a company. My co-founder, Steve Connor, uh, came out of Stanford University and is an expert at working with uh, unique particles, metal particles usually, um, had developed a unique material to replace silver on the back of solar panels and uh, stepped away after the technical development was done to see if he could not just print a single conductive trace between the cells, but build that up into a 3D part. So the very first parts we created were actually silver parts um, and he actually had the audacity uh, when we first met through Stanford Connections to suggest that maybe we could make silver tooling. Um, I didn't see a great fit for soft, really expensive, uh, probably aren't going to stick around in your tool room tools. Uh, but about a month and a half later, he came back and we were printing low carbon steel. Uh, and that was really exciting at the time. This is prior to when any of the kind of lower cost or kind of... Um, different uh, metal printing technologies that come out from desktop metal studio system or mark forge um, and so then we just started developing from there um, this is a picture we don't have a picture here of our first generation printer but it was really low cost we were printing metal um, in a low cost way prior to those other companies i mentioned or at least at the same time behind closed doors but we didn't really see what that we use for sort of a low 
uh, kind of a rough resolution metal printed part. And so we quickly added a shape refinement step to our printer. Um, this shows our second generation printer. It was a tabletop design. Um, I'll show you some parts in a second that came out of these systems, but um, it could produce some really amazing parts, but it was highly unreliable and um, both on accuracy and just longevity. Um, we then in integrated our technology into a, a CNC machine uh, because we'll talk about it later, I think, but our technology includes both additive and subtractive. And so we actually take advantage of the CNC platform for the shape refinement of our parts um, and enabled us to get to a new level of quality. So right from the beginning, in these early days, uh, if we, the company was founded in 2015, by 2016, 2017, we were printing parts, you can see over here on the second generation printer that had a surface finish in detail that was just miles different than what you would get from a powder bed fusion or a laser melting printer. Um, and then very, very different than our kind of the lower cost uh, competitors in, in MIM based printing. Um, so I'm actually gonna pause here um, on the screen and just show you some of these early parts because they're kind of fun. So this is one of our very first parts. Let me fix my um, uh, focus here. This was printed on a metal plate. It bonded itself directly to this metal plate, um, but you can hopefully see sort of the resolution that we were printing very early on uh, rough parts. This is, we went from there to uh, maybe slightly better. I, this is sort of still looks like it was rough hewn by a caveman in my, my mind, maybe a rough casting, sand casting. Um, but then we added that shape refinement step that I mentioned, and we went from something like this to something that looks like this, uh, where now you're getting a, a resolution and surface finish that none of our competitors at the time were able to achieve, with, especially at the price point that we're at. Um, last one I'll show you as we start to scale up in size. This is a, an injection mold, uh, half of an injection mold for a, a toy truck that was printed with our technology uh, and has a really smooth surface finish early on. Uh, I would like to say it was easy to go from these, these first samples to where we're at today, um, but it's actually taken a long development process to really meet the needs of the uh, tooling segment in terms of performance, surface finish, et cetera. And so, you know, from 2016 onward, we started working with early customers, getting feedback um, to really perfect our technology. And um, here is uh, our fourth generation printer. Um, with that feedback, we really designed a robust system that is designed for this tooling application. I think we're the only printing printer that's really fully designed for tooling. Um, and now we've deployed these out to customers. We have um, uh, a major medical device company and, um, and also a tool maker in, in Connecticut that have our systems. And along the way, to this point, we raised over $40 million. We built up an amazing team here in our California offices from our sourcing team to our metallurgists and, and software team. Um, and we're shipping our systems to customers uh, later this quarter. Um, and we're focused really on this injection mold tooling, though the same technology, we've started doing applications in um, extrusion dies, uh, stamped metal parts, uh, die cast are all areas that we're gonna expand into over time. That was a long-winded section, so feel free to <laughs> ask oh, there's, a lot there. there's a lot in there that we will explore. Like, so there a lot of things make your your company and your approach unusual. Um, the the actual process itself is unusual. I think I'll ask you about that in a bit. But like, I'm I'm, I'm gathering tooling was the focus either from the beginning or very early on, and I, I wonder if you could talk about that. Like, like how did you get there, and why is that the focus? Yeah, um, you're right. Uh, it, what we did very early on was say, we have an inkling of a technology. What are we going to do with it? Because I think in general, 3D printing, whether it's plastics or metals, as a new technology comes out of a, a university, let's say, what often happens is a team is formed, a company is formed even, maybe they even start selling a new printing technology. And then they spend the next five years trying to figure out what the heck to do with it. The Venn diagram of a 3D printing process in terms of its speed, its cost, uh, time to part, the surface finish, all of these things has actually been very difficult to overlap with, with production applications once you get out of prototyping. 
And we knew that the, the prototyping market was well served by the technologies were out there. And we wanted to have a technology that could have a big impact on the world in terms of, of mass production. And so with that inkling of, of moving to printing carbon steels, we spent time and I talked to many different um, folks in industry to understand where there was a need. And then I also took into account my own background. And so I'm a design engineer by uh, original training. I had spent uh, a decade developing products uh, and bringing them to market, both at a stateside, um, uh, low volume, high complexity manufacturing environment where we designed the products upstairs and made them downstairs, as well as uh, outsourced overseas uh, production of consumer products. Uh, while at my first company, I probably designed hundreds of machine metal parts, but I also designed probably a hundred plastic parts. And for those plastic parts, I made the design. I then designed the mold. I then went downstairs and manufactured the mold, and then I put it into production. And so I had firsthand experience as I was looking at these application areas to know that, wow, if we could get to the resolution and surface finish and strength for tooling, there's a big opportunity here. Um, and, you know, I like to um, kind of show what the world would look like if we get rid of tooling. Um, office environment uh, gets pretty uh, sparse uh, if you take away all the products that had a tool as part of, and the type of tools we make as part of their manufacture. So I like mentioned today, injection molded parts, but also stamped uh, parts, all your uh, file cabinets are, are stamped and bent. Um, all of these use tooling die cast parts. So it's really the products we use every day around us from this mouse to the things you see that disappeared in the screen are made with tools. And so that's why we, one of the reasons we focused on this market. It was also because over time, we built up the capabilities to really be highly successful here. Um, and so to deliver on tooling, you need a, a set of, of characteristics. One, just amazing surface finish. The traditional metal printers that you see in the marketplace, and we'll go and talk about this later, really print a rough casting-like surface. No one molds plastic against that surface finish. Um, we can print with a two to three micron RA surface finish, really smooth, almost exactly what you get after EDM. Um, we have really high accuracy, especially for the cost of our machine, um, which, well, as I mentioned on the earlier slide, is 350000 for the entire printing system, not just a printer, but everything you need to get to a part. Um, we can resolve fine features and details. Uh, and again, I'll show you, I showed you some early parts. I'll show you some others later to, to, to expound upon that. Um, we can enable new designs. So uh, conformal cooling and routing water through these tools is really beneficial um, and we can enable that. Um, we print durable steels. And lastly, our system is really straightforward and easy to use for, um, uh, for users. And so we've really created something that's specific to the tooling market and that delivers on what's needed in that space. Um, I've got a couple more slides. I won't go too much into these, but I will say uh, that when I started the company, I didn't think that supply chains and, and, and labor shortages would be what we're talking about, but the pandemic changed all that. And there's never been a time when there's been more reshoring in this industry, the plastics industry, the, and even in the manufacturing industry, I believe in the last 20 years than there is recently. Um, but we don't have the skilled labor to get there. And so, so, you know, the Mantle solution addresses a $45 billion market. Um, and it does so with a really specific machine and technology that can meet the needs. Specific machine and technology. So, let, so let's get into that. So in our earlier slide, we saw a reference to paste and the, the way metal paste figures into your process. I, I know your process um, involves no melting, no, no laser. Can you just kind of talk through the mantle process and how it works? Yeah, for sure. The, I personally break down metal printing into two big buckets. Now there are a few outside these buckets, but I think of them as in one camp, there are those technologies that melt metal um, and you have a melt pool that fought, that's somehow moved around. And, um, and then there's another technology uh, that's sintering. And sintering is what we do. Um, and it is really fundamentally taking metal powders putting them in with some method into the shape of what you want 
And then once you have that correct shape a little bigger, uh, you put it into a furnace and you densify it down to a solid metal part. Um, and so the melting camp is what uh, I would call the status quo. This is what EOS and um, ADUP and others use to, um, to create uh, aerospace parts and others. And it's expensive. And, and uh, most of those machines that are being run um, really need a highly skilled operator. And so our technology is based on the sintering side. And um, let me throw up a couple of slides here to walk you through exactly what we do and how it maybe differs from what's out there today. Um, I mentioned early on my co-founder as an expert at, at metal powders and putting them in liquids, which makes a paste or a slurry. Um, I don't think there are a whole lot of metal paste experts in the world, but we've got one here and that um, helped create our initial materials. And so those, that material is metal powders, all different sizes and shapes to, to get the best properties we want. Um, it's got a solvent or liquid in there and then a little bit of glue or binder that holds it together later in the process. And so um, once we have this paste, we put it in a cartridge, we supply it to our customers and we print it. We print it in the uh, extrusion style or an FDM style, very similar to a low cost plastic printer. Um, and at this stage, you've got this metal powder, these solvents and binders. We deposit this. One of the things that's unique about our paste versus let's say a thermoplastic or a plastic printer is with plastic printing, you get a bead of material and we lay it on top of another bead. And you can often get, you almost always get an interstitial space um, because that bead of material never fully covers the entire space with the next one around it. Our paste material actually flows into those cracks. And so we get a fully dense part um, as part of our printing, kind of different from the MIM-based processes. So we print on each layer. Um, uh, we then dry that layer. And that drying step removes the liquid components and solidifies these metal particles into a, a hard layer uh, that's held together with a little bit of that binder uh, that's, that was um, left over. Um, we do this, let's say uh, every, we do this for 10 layers, print and then dry, print and then dry. Uh, and then we come in and we get rid of the witness marks of the three traditional 3D printing. If we were to stop after just the printing and drying, you'd see the traditional layer lines that you get from 3D printing. And so we come in and we cut away the edges and exposed surfaces every 10 layers or so to get to a level of smoothness and detail that just wouldn't be possible uh, with any extrusion method uh, that would leave layers. Um, the nice thing about that shaping step is it's done when this material is not yet metal. It's just metal powders held together with a little bit of binder. And so we can cut this material 10 times faster than you can cut a tool steel, for example. And so we really take advantage of that to speed up this shaping process. And so in some respects, you'll hear us talk a lot about how our parts have very little post-processing. We sort of incorporate that post-processing into the printing process, but we do it when it's soft and easy to, and malleable to work with. Um, after we do that shaping step, um, or you, here, you can see here that, that repeated every few layers, and then every 10 layers, we do the shaping step. Um, after we do that, we transfer the part into a furnace where we densify down those metal particles and get rid of all the spaces in between them uh, into 70, uh, 97 plus percent dense parts um, that are now uh, fully tool steel with really isotropic material properties. And unlike a lot of the melting processes, which are basically like one big weld uh, that leave a lot of residual stresses where the part wants to bend after it's printed, ours have almost no uh, residual stresses. So they're very flat and stable um, after printing. Um, I'll mention a couple other aspects. And I actually have a video or two uh, to show this printing process. Um, I have uh, this part right here. Uh, that folks can take a look at uh, exactly the one that's on the screen. And you'll also see this part being built in one of these videos. Um, ours is a hybrid process, as we just talked about. It's an additive plus a subtractive step where you remove material. What's really unique is that um, while there are other hybrid technologies out there, they almost invariably require um, an operator to, stand in, to sit in front of a cam station and program which tools and how to cut the part. 
our technology does that fully automatically. Uh, we know the material, we know the tools that are in the machine, and we know how to cut this material to get a great surface finish. And so we've automated that entire step, which really cuts down the labor that would normally go into a hybrid process. Um, we can talk, we can watch a video of this uh, occurring here. So this is laying down the paste material, uh, an extrusion style that we, we lay it onto a, a white bed material that we, we uh, place on the machine ahead of time. Here you can see the drying step where we're drying it. Now we're loading the appropriate end mill to do the cutting step. And here we're shape refining those layers, cutting away just a tiny bit of that material to get rid of any of those witness marks of the printing process. And here you can see that sped up um, where we're printing the entire part. Great. Uh, one more video just shows a quick run of the sintering process. This is an animation. We take the part after it's been printed, put it into our um, F200 sintering furnace and it turns into a solid part. So this is an actual picture of that uh, part that was produced in this process. Yeah, so it's it's unique, it's different. Um, that's how we make metal around here in <laughs> Mantle. Sintering shrinks it by up to nine percent. I think I saw on on your slide. And but you're making you're making tooling components. You're making very dimensionally precise components. So I guess talk about your ability to predict and control the effect of the shrink. Yeah. So that, this is a huge differentiator between our technology and other sintering based technologies. Um, when you look at the dimensional change that happens from the printed part to what you take out of the furnace um, with other sintering based technologies. I would say the, the two biggest are in the, in the market. One is just metal injection molding is a, a standard way to make these type of parts. But then in the 3D printing world, binder jetting is probably the most common. Um, but then there's bound metal extrusion, which is, you know, has some similarities to what we do without the shaping. Um, Invariably, all those other technologies are somewhere in the range of 20 to 25% shrinkage from the printed part to what comes out of the process. It's very difficult to predict the final dimensions of a part when you have that much movement uh, and change. And so we're really unique in reducing that dimensional change down from 20, 25% to under 9%. No one else in the centering that I know of uh, is able to um, get to that level of, of, of reduced shrinkage. I'll show you one part here that is actually the one that you see in the screen, but from another vendor that um, used a sintering based process. This is what happens if you get a lot of movement in that sintering step um, and you don't uh, aren't able to account for it. The part cracks itself in half. Um, and so this is very common, uh, especially with parts that go from thick sections to thin sections. Uh, which are invariably tools do. And so that's a real differentiator for us is that we baked into the materials and the process of how we print them in the centering environment to reduce that shrinkage and get to plus or minus a thousand of an inch for small parts and just slightly more than that as parts get bigger within our envelope. Um, so we've kind of talked about um, um, Stresses, cost, dimensional control. Um, uh, is there anything else you'd like to say about this process relative to the more established ways we've come to think about metal 3D printing? Yeah, um, I think it'd be interesting to look at that. Um, let me throw up a slide here, just one second. Uh, yeah. So, we're not the first to try to make tools with metal printing. Um, there are other technologies out there. And so I um, put together a slide here to kind of look at those briefly. Uh, I would say, as I mentioned earlier, powder bed fusion or DMLS um, is the status quo in metal printing today in terms of been around the longest. Um, it's got some great capabilities. It's got a real flexible design freedom to do these organic shapes. Um, a mature process, it's still complicated though to get outcomes. Uh, and you can do some things with DMLS that we can't even do. For example, um, they're able to print a porous um, material in certain locations of the part. We've actually experimented this 
with this as well. But in our case, we'd print the entire part with this sort of uh, venting structure. Um, but it's also got some real challenges. The biggest one is the rough surface finish. Uh, and I'll show you some parts in a second uh, that kind of illustrate this. But once you print a part with um, a DMLS machine, you've got to do all this post-processing because the surface finish and the accuracy isn't enough for the tooling without that post-processing. So people are using it for the unique geometries you can get with 3D printing, but it's really taking more time and cost to get to the part you want for injection molding applications um, than, than you would like. Um, to try to fix some of those challenges and, and to really tackle the tooling space, a couple of manufacturers have, have created hybrid powder bed machines that do um, powder bed fusion where they melt these layers of, of metal powders. Uh, but then they come in, and, similar to us actually, every few layers in that machine and cut away uh, the roughness and, and improve the surface finish. The challenge is that you've got all the complexity of one of these million dollar powder bed fusion machines and a full CNC machine connected together. Um, and you've got to deal with the residual stresses such that even if the part looks amazing in surface finish when you're done, taking it off of the build plate can very often tweak that part to the point where it no longer has the same dimensions you expected. So interesting technology, but one that we haven't seen been a, being adopted very much, both because of the cost um, and that residual stress problem, then also uh, the time. These machines tend to be very slow because they're cutting true tool steels uh, in that cutting step, where in our process, I mentioned we're cutting this soft material that's not yet uh, densified into metal. Um, I'll mention really briefly, uh, MIM extrusion. We don't see much of this being used in tooling. It's low cost, but that's really rough and it's usually has interstitial spaces. So these parts often leak if you're trying to run water through cooling lines with them. Um, but it is one of the lower cost options that people might talk about. And then lastly, uh, we look at binder jetting, kind of the emerging production method. Um, promises to be really fast to print parts, um, but it does have a lot of steps and the printing process, the excavation process usually have a, uh, another oven that it needs to go into and then finally into the sintering oven. Um, before you can get there. The challenge for the type of tools that we make is really around tolerances, as I mentioned, that you can really only get a rough blank out of this process that's gonna need post-processing. And uh, one of the benefits of 3D printing are these unique cooling lines you can run through an injection mold. Binder jetting tends to be really challenged by that because as those lines get small and intricate, the powder gets stuck in them and there's really no way to get it out without breaking the part uh, in that process. And so, you know, I, there's some, um, you know, people are using these. Um, the primary one that they're using is powder bed fusion. And with powder bed fusion, almost invariably they're paying more and it takes longer to get a mold done this way, but they're getting that unique geometry uh, that is very beneficial in terms of speeding up the molding process, making it more efficient. Um, you know, if we look at the tooling process, just to illustrate this, um, we see it as a sort of a 12-step process going from quoting to finishing. And what that powder bed fusion process does today really is get you through this rough part phase. But you still have to do all of this post-processing afterwards, um, which is really where the challenge lies in terms of that extra cost and time. Um, with Mantle, we really try to combine the, the best parts of traditional tool making and the flexible geometries of 3D printing to get to a part that uh, is fast, cost-effective, and get these new geometries that are helpful with 3D printing. Um, I've got a couple parts here just to show that I think are helpful. So this is, um, any questions for you, Pete, before I move on here? No, go ahead, let's see the parts. Yeah, so this is uh, one that you saw on the screen here. This is from a uh, DMLS machine. Uh, it's can do these unique cooling lines that go in here and then actually go up into this boss and back down again. So really is able to make an injection mold tool more efficient. You get more parts per hour and you actually get a better quality part by controlling the temperatures better. Um, but you can see this rough surface finish. It's like a rough casting, a sand casting. And so everyone that's using this technology today prints it larger than it needs to be. And then you have to mount this part onto a CNC machine and then onto an EDM machine to get the to smooth out the space between this small boss and this, this vertical one. Uh, and that's expensive and time consuming. And so what Mantle is really known for is being able to print 
a part that comes out with a two to three micron RA surface finish, a really smooth surface finish that you can mold right up against the as printed part. So in the case of most of our customers, um, they do little to no post-processing on where the plastic actually hits the metal. And they might do some fitting around the edges and um, or come in afterwards to do a little extra post-processing where, where needed. Um, here you can see the detail that we can get to um, in here. This, these are uh, really fine gear teeth that are made with our process. Again, you really can't resolve these with those other methods from what we've seen um, along the way. Uh, and then of course you can do uh, things like polishing, uh, texturing, et cetera, everything that you're gonna need to be able to do with a, a traditional injection mold. So what's the process challenged by? Are, are there limitations to, to Mantle's process? Like are there, are there mold features or are there types of molds that um, this process has difficulty with? Yeah, our process does everything perfectly and there's no limitations. Good to know. <laughs> okay, so maybe, maybe that's not true. Um, yeah, so there are certainly limitations to what we do just like any manufacturing process. Um, one of those is certainly size. Um, our printing, our printer has an envelope that's eight inches by eight inches by six inches. Most of the parts we're printing today are more like five and a half by five and a half by two and a half or three. Um, and th that's kind of a sweet spot for where we're at with the development of the technology right now. Um, so we're not printing bumper size molds, but you know, that eight by eight by six envelope, um, we believe is around, uh, 70% plus of all the plastic parts made in the world today. And so it really does cover a lot of the um, uh, of the industry. And one of the reasons we we kind of kept it at that size was to keep the price reasonable, uh, to make sure that as we get bigger, that everything is going to get more expensive. And we wanted to keep our system at three hundred fifty thousand dollars fully in, which is about what you pay for a CNC or an EVM machine every few years. Um, so that's one of the limitations. Another one, if you saw uh, some of our parts, uh, just very similar to powder bed fusion or, or DMLS. Um, we print uh, up to a 45 degree unsupported. Um, and so we don't currently have a support material involved in our process. And so our tier, our, our cooling channels, for example, are teardrop shaped to make sure that you can support it. Um, we don't find that that's really a limitation, especially in tooling where tooling components by definition are almost always straight pull. They are sort of designed in this way. And so that's one of the reasons we um, haven't spent a lot of time investing in that area yet. We have some aspect ratios. We try to uh, maintain a 10 to one aspect ratio for ribs. Um, and then we also um, are limited by that shaping step. Uh, I say limited, but, but we're really not anymore. When we first started, we had the smallest tool we did was about a 20 thousandths ball, which would leave a 10 thousandths radius. We recently announced that we released um, at the PT Expo uh, a, a, a high performance uh, precision package that allows you to go down to a 6,000th diameter ball end mill. And that will leave a 3,000th radius, which is very commonly thought of as the sharpest you can get from sinker EDM anyway. Uh, AKA, we're kind of in line with the characteristics of the traditional methods, whether it be CNC or EDM in terms of those, um, those uh, the features we can resolve. Um, okay, so... So all that speaks to geometry. That's what we've been talking about. The, the performance of a tool is determined by material also. Let's talk about materials. Um, can, you, can you talk about the strategy for material development for this process? What, what materials are you good at now and what materials will the process be good at in the future? Yeah, so this is again where we diverge from a lot of the other metal printing companies um, that usually start with a kind of a generic stainless, a 316 or a, a 17.4 pH stainless. We don't print those materials today, primarily because we're tooling focused. And so what we've developed is a suite of tool steels. Um, and we've really focused on the ones that are most relevant to the injection molding space first. And then we're, we're starting to uh, put on our roadmap uh, materials that are relevant beyond injection molding into more stamping uh, extrusion dies, et cetera, going to harder materials. Um, so let me grab a slide here. Um, today we have two materials. One is a, a P20 equivalent tool steel that comes out at a 32 Rockwell. The other is true H13 tool steels, chemically equivalent to what toolmakers use every day. 
um, and it comes out of our printing process at 42 and can be heated up to 52, 54 Rockwell with heat treatment. Um, the next material in development for us is a 420 stainless steel, a uh, very popular in medical device segment, um, which as you know, one of our systems is already at a major medical OEM. Um, that's our next in a roadmap. And then most likely after that, we'll be looking at something like a D2 tool steel to, to focus on these extrusion and stamping applications where the hardness getting up to even above um, the high 50s into the 60s is really beneficial uh, in the material side. And then, oops, let me go back here, just one sec. Um, I sort of hinted at this earlier, but one of the key things that we think about that, again, is sort of indicative of how we are focused on this application and delivering a solution to customers versus a technology they have to figure out is that we've done all of the normal processing you would do on a tool steel in a mold making process because we know someone's gonna have a problem. They're either gonna need to weld it eventually to add more material, or they're gonna have to cut a little more away to get to the geometry that they need or EDM it. And so we've done all that work from uh, texturing to, um, to EDM and, and milling to make sure that it behaves as you'd expect. Um, we've also done the, the due diligence on the durability. And so, you know, this is a, a tool we uh, made with Tessie Plastics uh, upstate New York. Let me see if I can get the focus here. You can see the insert that we made. Uh, it molds the back end of this geometry on this part, um, which is a packaging component. Um, and we've now done 1.65 million cycles. And what the Tessie team tells us is our steels are wearing just like traditional tool steel. Um, and that's what we want to be able to deliver to our customers is a durable material that can be used for not just prototyping, but all the way to full volume production. Um, in this case, uh, interesting case study we have with uh, Fathom uh, Digital Manufacturing, where we produced um, these inserts that were dropped into these larger bases. Um, and we really were able to cut down on the processes that they had to do and the time and cost, but there was even with some additional post-processing. So in this case, there were some features we couldn't fully resolve with our printing process. You can see the difference here on the left to the right where they had they came back in and did some additional EDM. But even with that extra EDM, what they told us is they went from 200 hours down to 110 hours of total time. And they took their EDM time from 100 hours down to 27. So even in the cases where there may be a, a, a detail we can't fully resolve, we're still cutting the time and the cost of tool making dramatically with our technology. And you know, we'll, we'll continue to improve those, those capabilities. We, we released a speed improvement of 15% last year to our existing customers, and we'll continue to be able to roll out those improvements. But even without that, we're really driven, delivering strong ROI to our customers in terms of lead time and cost reductions. The the Tessie Plastics example was was at a at a quantity that that looks like scale production. Um, a lot of times we think about three D printed tooling and we think about it being applied strategically for a challenging detail like for, with conformal cooling, or used in a case where a quick prototype is needed. Um, get, how are um, the users so far applying? the mantle tool making capability, is, is, it, is it for those realms that we tend to associate with 3D printed tooling? Yeah, uh, for sure. What, what I've seen with the use of 3D printing for tooling today and injection molding is with other technologies, let's say DMLS, which is the most used, as I mentioned earlier, um, People are choosing to use DMLS technology to make a tool because they can make these cooling lines in a more optimized fashion. Because they have a problem they're trying to solve in terms of the cycle time and speeding it up or the part quality. And so they're willing to, get, to use a million dollar printer and deal with all that post-processing that we talked about to get to a tool that's more efficient or uh, makes a better quality part. Um, and so when I go into a, a tool shop and I ask a tool maker, hey, what percentage of the tools you make could benefit from having the flexibility to put these cooling lines where you want them, this conformal cooling technology? 
the, the, the logic that's sort of going through their head is, okay, it's gonna cost more, it's gonna take longer, and there's more risk to it because I got this new technology I'm using. I better really justify the usage of, of this conformal cooling benefit to those projects that where it makes sense. Um, and we like to flip that on its head. And I say to that same tool maker, what if we could uh, reduce the cost of making a tool? What if we could reduce the lead time to make that tool? And then as icing on the cake, you can do these cooling lines however you want. What percentage of the tools uh, you make would you use that uh, this new technology for? And they basically always come back and say, well, I'd, I'd use that for every tool. I mean, <laughs> that sounds great. <laughs> and so that's what we were focused on is really delivering first on speed, um, second on cost, either parity or cost reduction, and then enabling the, the usage of this conformal cooling technology um, uh, without those, those downsides um, and been able to use it in, in many different tools. So um, I've got a couple examples of this. I won't go too much into formal cooling, because like I said, we think it's, and we enable it, um, but it's w just one of the benefits of our technology versus um, other, other usages. A um, couple projects we've done here, we saw 25% cycle time improvement with this automotive part on a, on a part that we printed. We've done projects with Pepsi to uh, conformally cool. This is a, a bottle mold at the bottom where it's very difficult to get the heat out. Uh, we did a very successful project with them that had basically no post-processing on the printed part uh, to enable a really great surface finish on the final outcome. And then you ask sort of the question of how does this play into the usage and how are people using this? It, it really goes from prototyping through to bridge tooling where you're gonna do, you know, maybe a thousand, 5,000, 10,000 shots to full scale production, like in the Tessie case. Um, and what we find is that um, we're able to really help people de-risk the tooling early um, through this and, and get to the part they need uh, in a way that other, let's say, early methods can't. One of the advantages of ours is that we're actually using true tool steel. If you have a injection mold that is very simple geometry that can be machined very easily, we're probably not going to add as much value. If you have a, uh, an injection mold that uses EDM, just even a little bit or a significant amount, we're gonna have a significant impact on that because of the surface finish and detail we can resolve uh, in that case. So this one you see on the left here, these, these uh, gear teeth uh, definitely would need EDM and we'd really delivered um, significant time and cost savings on this, on that project. Um, here's another one that we've done, uh, some uh, articles on where we printed a, a cavity and a core and an insert actually uh, that went right from our printer with a little fitting. You can see them fit here and all the molding surfaces were not touched uh, prior to molding. I actually have a, that part right here in my hand so you can see the, um, the part and I can pause the screen share so it's a little bit bigger. Um, again, and here's the final part. Uh, every surface of this molded part uh, is plastic that went right up against what we printed. Uh, no post-processing needed on those areas, just some fitting in the other areas. Um, so really delivering on a, a level of speed that wouldn't have been possible otherwise. Um, in this case, going from 180 hours of sort of operations time down to less than 12, um, and then cutting the lead time from 12 weeks down to two weeks. So just a really a stepwise change in what's possible with our technology uh, in these different type of applications. So stepwise change. So you're you're describing the the chance to change the 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 pacing, the economics, the the possibilities for for mold tooling. Um, what that makes me think about is like I, I we can see how that helps the mold maker. We can see how that helps the molder. I wonder if there are ways that the OEMs conceiving these plastic parts in the first place are thinking differently in light of technology like this? Have you seen examples of that? Um, for sure, for sure. Um, I was surprised. Uh, we think of our market as, as uh, our, our technology as serving sort of three distinct audiences. One is a uh, tool maker, pretty obvious. They make tools. 
The second is a molder who molds the plastic parts and almost invariably every molder has a tool shop that they use for either small mold builds or for mold fixes, uh, repairs. Uh, and then the OEM who um, obviously wants the final part. And we actually have had great success selling into each of these different areas. In the case of the molder, what we're seeing is their ability to just get business for molding because they've been able to quickly make a tool and de-risk that tool so that the customer knows that they what they get is what they want and that they that the molder can can deliver. Um, the lead time improvement's been huge there. At the OEM level, what we've really seen is de-risking a product early. Uh, one area that we've seen really strong adoption has been in the medical device space where you need to produce your medical device in the same production method during the early stages as in full production to get FDA approval. And we allow that to happen, a true steel tool early on, very quick, um, that then can be used um, uh, all the way through the process with the same tool being used for bridge production and then maybe a multi-cavity version of that, again, using 3D printing in full production. Um, I didn't expect OEMs to be as excited about de-risking the actual tool um, uh, as they are. And the reason is, is that you can get from an aluminum tool, let's say, or even a plastic, plastic printed inserts off a 3D printer, you can get a part or two out. But with an aluminum tool or that plastic insert, the molding process is gonna be so different than it would be with a true steel tool that you'd use in production that you really can't take any learnings from one to the other. You might have to start over and, and, and and change your design multiple times once you get to the steel tool. Uh, with our technology, you can get to that steel tool much faster and uh, de-risk it uh, along the way. Um, and that's what uh, folks have been excited about. I'll show one case study here of a medical device component. Um, in this case, we produce these um, inserts. You can see A, B, C, D here on the right. They all come together to create this plastic part above. Uh, it's a medical device that goes into the human body. We were able to shave for this medical OEM their uh, new product introduction process from 12 weeks down to four. And the cost of the tooling was cut by two thirds down to $21,000. And in the end, when they did the production run, they sent these parts to their QA department. They said, these are fully past our QA. Uh, and they went into a full production run of these parts as a result because we deliver the same quality plastic part, we just got there so much faster and at lower cost. And so that's how OEMs are really thinking about our technology is how do I use this to bring a product to market faster and to de-risk the production so that when it gets into production, I know it's gonna be the part I want and perform the way I want. What you're saying is you can, you can be prototyping with a steel tool without having to cut steel and potentially go straight to production with that prototype tooling. No question, no question. And um, and that's the, the flexibility you get to, to be able to quickly get that first tool and then know what your production is gonna be like because you've, you've started with a true steel tool, but without the downside of the, of the, of the time and cost. Um, okay, so so other other issues that are affecting um, um, manufacturing tool making in particular um, and, and how, this, how this technology might speak to that, um, labor. Um, talk to the potential connection between this 3D printing process for tooling and um, difficulty finding skilled labor in the, in the tooling arena. Uh, another thing I didn't expect <laughs> when I first started the company, and again, I think it's been exacerbated by uh, this global pandemic thing that happens to be have fallen upon us the last few years. Um, but finding labor has been a real challenge across this whole ecosystem, across manufacturing in general, I would say, but also in the plastics ecosystem where we play heavily. Um, we've actually seen a few different trends here. Um, give me a second. Let me grab a slide. Okay. Um, the first thing we've seen is, is actually lead times going up. Um, if you look at 2017 to 2019, versus 2020 to 2022, huge number of respondents said that uh, their lead times are increasing in, in that time period, uh, whether it be US or foreign based tooling. Um, and so you've got that on one side, we're like, okay, uh, it's taking longer to get these tools. 
um, you're also seeing price increases. So with that lead time and with the, um, uh, whether US or overseas, prices are going up. So now you've got a double whammy of it takes longer and it costs more to get your tool done. But on the flip side, what we're also seeing is that demand is increasing each year. Um, so each year we're seeing a 10 to you know, 18 to 14% increase in the number of plastic parts that are needed. Um, and so we're seeing plastic usage scale, um, but we're not seeing the tooling space respond to, to at the same rate. Um, and that's getting into this crunch in terms of um, lagging the US tooling industry lagging behind molding growth. Um, so what this is doing is causing companies to say, okay, it's gonna cost more overseas than it used to. It's gonna take longer, especially if it gets stuck in a boat uh, out of a port and I can't get it on, on land, like what happened in the pandemic. How can I fix this? They're saying, let's bring more production back to the US. There, in the recent uh, survey of uh, molders, they asked how many of you are actually doing reshoring, bringing uh, business back to the US. And it was the highest number since they'd run the survey that are actually doing it already. But the problem is, is that we don't have the skilled labor in the United States to make these tools. We just don't. Um, you can see the numbers here of people involved in this trade. Um, and we've lost a lot of that competency. I, we talked to a company the other day, has multiple tool makers. Their youngest tool maker has been on the job for 25 years um, of the four that they have. Uh, and they're starting to, to retire. Um, and so what we believe is that we need an automated solution um, that can solve this labor problem uh, because labor shortages are having a huge negative effect and you can't just find a tool maker overnight. It's, it's four to five years, 10,000 hours of training just to get to the journeyman level of tool making. And so our technology allows a single tool maker to have more projects because now they're not sitting in front of a machine, they're not sitting in front of a, a, a computer co programming the cam, they're able to outsource that to Mantle technology and work on more projects at the same time, uh, get more throughput without additional really skilled labor and instead being able to utilize uh, folks that like myself even, or uh, you uh, that can run this technology and get a really high quality part out. So we're really leaning into uh, the need here to automate as a way to reduce the labor needs, which it's not a question of uh, taking these jobs away from people. It's a question of finding anyone that has the skills to do these jobs. Um, and so that's how we've been thinking about it and really focusing on, on this challenge. So Ted, we're, we're closing in on the top of the hour. And while, while you and I were talking, various audience questions have come in. So I, I think what I'd like to do here is pivot and just like start knocking out as many of these audience questions as we can. Um, um, uh, the first one I see um, re refers to uh, software control and the resulting accuracy, particularly um, uh, getting the XYZ dimensionality you're after um, after Sinter, given that the geometry is li liable to be complex, can you speak to um, the software element of the system? Yeah, um, our, our software does pre-calculations mm -hmm. in terms of what the dimensional change is of the part in uh, the sintering environment. Um, what we find, and this is very common with other sintering based processes, is you get very uh, similar shrinkage in X and Y, but your Z is affected by this thing on this planet, which is both helpful and a pain in the butt, which is called gravity. Um, and so we get a different shrinkage rate in the Z realm. Our shrinkage is so low down at that under 9% that whether it's a thick section or a thin section, they actually shrink very similarly. And so we do, we do, do some software um, compensation for our parts, but our biggest lever to get a great quality part is to reduce that shrinkage as much as possible. And that's why we're less than half of anybody else in sintering today. And that's why we get a better quality part out. So our software does part of it. It does it automatically, um, but it's also our unique materials and process that sort of make true sort of deep software manipulation of the part ahead of time, which people are using, but I would say to okay effect, you know, you can get rid of really gross 
issues, uh, but we just don't have those gross issues to get rid of because our, our materials are more stable in the sintering process. Different question. Is it possible with this process to print onto a metal part or onto an existing tool? Um, in the case of tool repair, for example. Yeah, good question. And this is an area where we diverge from DMLS technology, uh, where you can take a part, put it into the uh, machine and print on top of it. Our technology uh, goes through that dimensional change. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I showed you this really rough part from early on. You can print onto metal, um, but the metal stays the same size and my part shrinks a little bit. And so it's a little hard to see here, but this part is pretty warped because it's held at the bottom and bonded to this metal while the rest of the top of the part wants to move. So the answer to the question is, our technology does not enable uh, the use of an existing base that you print on top of. Um, you have to always start with uh, a separate full part that goes through the entire process. Can you print threaded holes in a mold? Um, so what we would do with threads, like what you can see here on this part, uh, let me see if I can get my camera to focus a little better, um, is we can print them and we can resolve them uh, for uh, this. We haven't done a threaded Z hole. So if I was to look down at a hole this direction, uh, that may be something that we release later um, as, an, as an addition to our uh, system. There's no reason why we can't shape them that way, uh, but, but our system currently doesn't have that capability. So holes in the Z direction, would need to be printed a little bit undersized and then tapped afterwards. Uh, this audience member is is responding to what you said about the about the envelope size of the machine and is asking, is there a way to get to a larger mold by maybe building separate inserts and combining them together? For sure. Um, I mean, this is done all the time. There's actually some advantages to this because by putting multiple inserts in, you get usually inherently you can do venting at those in intersection lines and get rid of any extra air that would be caught during the molding process. Um, you will usually get a very fine witness mark um, at those intersections of doing separate pieces. And so uh, it just depends on your application. If it's a B side of a tool, like the inside of a part like this versus the outside, and you you're okay with that, then our technology is gonna work great. There's also that advantage on a B side, that that's usually where you would take advantage of conformal cooling as well. Um, so you can definitely print in sections and put them together. Usually what would happen in that case is that you would a, a print at the edges where you're going to put them together a little bit larger, and you would uh, grind those surfaces to make sure they're perfectly flat. And when they uh, seat together, you get the minimal amount of that seaming uh, as, as possible. Uh, Ted, you're showing various parts, and and one audience member um, um, asked pretty plainly um, the build time for the parts you're displaying. Can you bring a couple parts back in front of the camera and just talk about how long start to finish it took to make that part? Sure. Um, I will give you my best estimate um, <laughs> because I'm not using our, our software every day to, to do that. But let's say this part, which was um, one that I showed earlier, uh, you can see, I don't know what this is, maybe three inches by three inches by an inch and a half or something. This is probably a two to three day print with our technology. Uh, and then it will go into our sintering furnace for somewhere between 30 to 36 hours usually. Um, so you have another day plus day and a half of the sintering cycle. Um, the nice thing about uh, our technology is that it really is lights out and, and plug and play. So once you put the material into the machine, press go, it is going all by itself for the entire printing process. There is a transfer at the end where you take this and just simply transfer it into the furnace. Um, and then again, that 30 to 36 hours is un, unattended and there's no other steps in there. When you look at binder jetting, for example, there's usually the, the printing step, there's a curing step, that's in a, there's a uh, de-powdering step, uh, and there's finally a sintering step um, in the furnace. And so we have just two different processes that are fully automated um, in that. Um. 
This question, you spoke to this very briefly when you were mentioning Tessie Plastics, but um, the longevity of tooling made this way, what have you observed? We have observed that our materials wear in line with uh, traditional tool steels that we make. So H13, for example, our materials today are uh, lasting just as long as traditional tool steel. There might be, I don't know, plus or minus 10% difference, um, but we haven't even hit that in terms of the applications that are high volume production yet uh, with our, our materials. So very durable um, tool steels. And the fact, in one case, we swapped out three traditionally manufactured inserts in a multi-cavity tool to, to do a head-to-head -head comparison. The two mantle inserts are still in production, our, our P20 and our H13. They actually put a S7 insert in there as well that was manufactured traditionally. It cracked after three months of use and had to be taken out and replaced by a traditionally manufactured insert where the Manta ones are still uh, being used without any uh, issues. And so, you know, I would say all of our data today shows that we're hitting uh, equivalents uh, and we'll learn more as we get to those numbers that go beyond 2 million up to 5 million cycles, um, kind of where that limit lies. Um, we're, we're just a shade past three o'clock. We'll keep going a little bit longer and take just a couple more questions. Um, can you comment, Ted, on the, on the polymers that you've molded with, with this tooling? What, what, is there a limitation on the polymers you can inject? No, we haven't found one. I mean, these are true tool steel tools that we come up with. There's not, these aren't some ceramic or something different. Um, our abrasion resistance is in line with what you'd expect from an H13 or a P20. Um, we've uh, molded at least 30% glass fill. We may have gone even 40%. Um, we have done soft plastics uh, from uh, the whole range. We've done Rydell and high temperature plastics, um, Delrin. Um, so we really have proven out that it acts like a traditional steel tool. Um, so that's one of the advantages when you use that technology is that you're able to get to a true plastic part that you want. There's not, not like uh, 3D plastic resin printing in particular where the materials are so different from traditional thermoplastics. We're making a tool that you can mold a variety of materials from. Uh, last one I'll say is we've even done some composites that are sort of uh, thermoplastic composites materials uh, with very great success. Um, one more question, this, this audience member asks, can you comment on the ability to polish mold parts produced with mantle to a high gloss mirror finish? Is it possible? And do you have examples of customers doing this? Yeah, so I, sh I think I showed at this part earlier, um, we have been able to polish our uh, parts up to an A2 finish. Um, we have not been able to polish beyond that to an A1 uh, finish. So I would not use our technology for true um, lenses, for example but optically clear um, parts, we have done um, and uh, have had good success there. All right, let's leave it at that. So that'll conclude today's webinar. We've been talking to Ted Sorum of Mantle. Thank you, Ted. Thank you, uh, it's been fun. Thanks everybody for uh, taking the time to learn about Mantle. Uh, feel free to reach out to us. Our website's mantle3d, the number three letter d.com. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, we, we focus on this and this, uh, you know, application uh, directly on the tooling side. So if you've got a tooling problem, we'd love to help. Uh, everyone who's hearing this, an email with a link to a recording of this presentation should come to you soon. Um, other than that, thank you so much for your time and attention today. Um, thanks for the great questions. Um, Pete Zielinski, Additive Manufacturing Media. Take care. Cheers.